so years ago, Mike Shade, people I knew, a couple of them I thought were pretty good friends, sent me this book, Wind Up Girl. Kind of freaked me out. Uh, Paolo, as you know, is, the, is one of the kings of happiness and, and uh, <laughs> upbeat stories. That's why it's kind of amusing to read the look at the zombie book. I'm like, that's such a fun change of pace. But it was, I think it was Shipwreck that really made me think, wow, that book really blew my socks off. I thought, you can get away with that in Hawaii, but that's a pretty vicious Hawaii book. I really like Shipwreck. Not that I didn't sell like stacks and stacks of wine number. The biggest problem is was the publisher could not seem to keep them in stock fast enough for people like us to sell them, which I thought was quite unfair. Uh, so this time we have this giant pile of uh, his new ones. So I so expect you. I <laughs> say you just tell your friends I've got a big stack of signed ones here, and you should send them here. Uh, so I started reading the Water Knife, and I thought about water for years. So I was telling him since I read Heinlein's Farm in the Sky, and the idea of what would really have to us if like, you know, not just like, you know, the cable goes out for a couple of days, like what if like there's a major earthquake and you can't get water and food and you can't get to the store, and how many of us would make it a week? Uh, well, Seattle would be bad enough, I'd imagine you lived in Arizona or Colorado, and in the future not possibly too far distant where things are really vicious about water, who owns it, who's going to do what with it, and so this is where we get the water knife. How many folks have actually read it yet? Okay, so I don't want to say too much about it, except to say that uh, people are not playing nice. <laughs> and what Paolo does especially is makes you care what's going on because of the arcane technology of what aquifer does this and who owns the scene right there. It's, will the people in this book survive? Will they have a happy ending? Will they end up totally screwed? Um, there's some really compelling characters in there. I'm, I actually was surprised how fond I was of Angel in particular. <laughs> Without further ado, please welcome Paolo Bacicalupi. Hey everybody, thank you for coming out. Um, I, I always get really nervous when I stand up in front of audiences. I have a little moment of fight or flee sort of reactions. And so um, if you notice me shaking, it's just sort of like that residual sort of terror of standing in front of people while they look at you. Um, <laughs> stop looking at me. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so um, I'm Paolo Bacigalupi, and I've had a really weird career. <laughs> Um, I write about terribly depressing things, and people seem to like that. Um, it is sort of funny, because I'm, I'm always anticipating the worst, and lately my wife has started saying, you know, I think you can enjoy it a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, actually it's interesting, with Wind Up Girl, uh, nobody, we, we, none of us had any idea what was going to happen with that book. Um, you know, Nightshade was just hoping that, you know, they wouldn't lose their shirts on the, on the book. And, uh, and, and so we were all sort of stunned when they suddenly realized that they'd run out of stock. And, and they kept doing these, like, small reprints at first because they couldn't believe that anybody was really buying the book. <laughs> and that's why <laughs> Dwayne was having so much trouble <laughs> getting out extra copies because Nightshade would wait until it was all run out before they were like, okay. I think it's okay for us to print more. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, anyway, that, and so now it's interesting though to have, have Knopf backing me where, where you know, now there are expectations. And I think it's sometimes, it's, 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 it feels a lot safer to sort of have no expectations, that you, you, you wildly exceed rather than high expectations. And you're like, are we gonna get there or is everybody gonna be looking at me with sadness and embarrassment later on? And Knopf will never invite me back. But um, regardless, I liked writing the book, so too bad for them. And I get to keep the advance, so I'm all good. Uh, um, so I thought tonight I would talk uh, a little bit about um, what I think about with my writing uh, and what interests me in writing, and, uh, and then some about the water knife, and then read a little bit. And then I'd open up the floor to questions, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have about, um, about science fiction, about my books, about writing, whatever, you know, whatever things you're curious about. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed as, as my career has taken off and as I've actually been able to say I am indeed a professional writer um, is that I'll end up in these strange conversations with people where, where you know, we're talking at a coffee shop or whatever, I meet somebody on an airplane or whatever and they say, so what do you do? I say, I'm a writer. And, uh, and they say, oh, what do you write? And I say, I write science fiction. And they look at me and they say, oh, <laughs> I don't read that. <laughs> You're like, ow. <laughs> and it's really interesting because you have this moment where you said, I, I write science fiction, and then whatever they heard was 
something different, the symbol words that were in my head when I said those words versus the symbol words that apparently arrived in their head are completely different. And I'm pretty sure that they have to do with rocket ships and Barbarella and I don't know, something, something crazy anyway. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, sort of frustrating because you're sort of like, wait, like I thought we were having a conversation and now there's a wall between us. Like how to, you know, what happened here? And, and so you start trying to find other ways to kind of get past that wall that they just suddenly put up. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll talk about the details of what I'm actually interested in. I'll say, oh, actually, so I talk, I create stories like what would the world look like if, you know, the world was controlled by giant calorie corporations a lot like Monsanto? What would, the, what would it be like if they, if they made everybody come back and buy their seeds every year and the only way you could get any seeds at all was from them? And what if they kept jacking up the prices every year? And, and suddenly everybody's like, Oh, yeah, you know, actually, I was just reading this book by Michael Pollan, and, and they're like, oh, and, you know, and the subtext sort of is, oh, I guess you aren't an idiot after all. <laughs> I guess you write something interesting, and you're like, well, thank you, sort of. Um, and so that's, you know, one sort of access point, in the same way I can talk now about the, the water knife, um, where I can say, oh, yeah, I'm writing about drought, I'm writing about a mega drought that hits the southwest, and look at that, I'm going to set up the cover there, that's sort of pretty. <laughs> I was really excited about the cover, actually, when they, when they showed it to me. I was just like, oh my god, this is gorgeous. Now I feel like a real author. Um, but, you know, I can talk and say, I'm, oh, I'm writing about this mega drought, and I'm talking about, uh, you know, what would happen if the Colorado River keeps getting lower and lower, as we already know it is, and, and what would happen. And I sort of write about this giant water war that sort of breaks out between Las Vegas and Phoenix, and California is waiting to try to get a hold of its share of the water. And, uh, and they say, oh, yeah. We're in a drought. I'm like, yes, you are. <laughs> and again, you have that moment of connection. And, uh, and so that's sort of one way of kind of going at it. Um, when I write YA books, a lot of times what we'll say is that I write dystopian fiction because that's sort of the way that YA sort of avoids saying the word science fiction. Um, it's sort of interesting because people don't really respect you when you say that you write for teens either. And, and then it's interesting to see teen fiction not respecting science fiction. It's like, it's, but um, but yeah. So the thing the thing about saying that you write dystopian fiction though is that I feel like it kind of misses. Uh, it, again, this has to do with symbol words, right? What does this symbol word you know evoke in your head, and what does it evoke in mine? And when I'm thinking about dystopia, I typically think about worlds that were intended to be perfected. Um, were worlds that, that were supposed to be perfect and yet they are hell for the individuals that have to live in them. Um, and, and that's not what I write. I don't write, you know, the George Orwell 1984s, the Yevgeny Zamyatin's Wheeze or any of those things, you know. Um, these are not intended to be perfect worlds. I, write, I tend to write, one way I described it is that I write um, broken futures. Um, sometimes I, I say I write accidental futures um, because that kind of gets a little bit closer to the feel of, of the worlds that, I, that I'm writing. These are the worlds where sort of somebody dropped the face of the future and it shattered and now everybody has to live in the shards. Nobody said, oh yeah, I'd love to break this place. They're just stuck there living among the junk. Um, uh, and similarly with accidental futures, these are the sort of ones where we tripped into the wrong timeline, we fell down, and we're like, wait, I didn't want to be here, I don't want to be here, why didn't, you know, why couldn't I end up in a better timeline, why couldn't I end up with a better future? Um, and so that's sort of a way of sort of talking about, like, at least what the feel of the futures that I'm interested in is. Um, Margaret Atwood has this amazing duck and dodge that she uses uh, to get past science fiction. And, <laughs> And it's, 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 it's great. She says that she writes anticipations. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I mean, and it's good because it does kind of give you this sense of like what the fiction is supposed to do. I'm anticipating an idea. I'm anticipating a future. I'm leaning into something with my stories. And so there's an elegance to that. I mean, she's a good writer, right? So she's good with words, right? And uh, so anticipations. Um, sometimes I've said that I write extrapolations um, because that's the tool set that I'm really interested in. Those are the science fiction, that's, how, that's the tool out of the science fictional toolbox that I reach for again and again and again is, is I extrapolate. I, it sounds dirty. <laughs> um, I, I compulsively extrapolate. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I extrapolate. And so what I do is I look around for a trend. <laughs> you can keep laughing at me, I'm gonna start laughing too. Um, 
I, uh, I will um, look at a trend and I'll, I'll think about it and I'll say, okay, so if this trend becomes the most dominant trend, if this trend starts to take over everything else and define everything else, uh, what kind of world will that create? If this goes on, what will the world look like? If this becomes more and more severe, what will the world look like? So I can do that with Monsanto and their business practices, or I can do it with, with drought in the Southwest. If I'm looking at Lake Mead right now, and I can see that Las Vegas has been digging deeper and deeper into Lake Mead, they have intake number one, which is at a certain elevation, and they dig deeper for intake number two, and they're finally now drilling intake number three, which is pretty much into the bottom of Lake Mead, there's a trend there, and you can look at it, and you can say, okay, so if that goes on, what kind of world are we going to get? How desperate for water are we going to get? And so those are the kinds of things that I sort of think about when I'm, when I'm sort of uh, picking up pieces and trying to figure out what kinds of stories I want to work on. And, you know, the, the thing that I've noticed, though, is that for some reason, the trends or the details that I'm obsessed with are different from the trends and details that other writers sort of obsess on. Um, and, uh, you know, nobody else looks at Lake Mead and says, aha, now there's a story I could write some science fiction about. Um, which is really too bad, because I sort of feel like I have a lot, far too much territory to myself right now. I sort of wish there was, were more people who are sort of obsessed with the same weird things that I am. But I'm sort of like, I've been thinking a lot about like, why do these kinds of details and why do these kinds of trends jump out at me? And what is the thing that sort of makes me focus in on a certain trend or an idea and think this is what I want to focus on, this is what I want to extrapolate about. Um, and what, I've, what I sort of realized, and, and this was only fairly recently actually, was um, that I was, uh, I was reading a, a book by a guy named Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And Taleb is this really interesting nonfiction writer. He mostly writes, actually, his writings mostly relate to the financial industry, but um, he wrote this really interesting book called Black Swan. And, and for those of you who don't know what a black swan is, a black swan is something that hasn't been predicted by our historical experience. Um, it's something that sort of comes out of nowhere. All of the data that we had before told us that it was impossible, and now here it is. Um, and so the example being, we all know that swans are white because all we've seen are white swans, so we assume that no black swans exist. And that's a very reasonable assumption, except for that then we run into a black swan and we find out our data set was wrong. Um, and, uh, and so there are a lot of examples of this, uh, particularly in a really complex, sort of highly integrated human society. The 2008 financial collapse was an example of a black swan. Everybody thinks like, oh yeah, our financial system works, we've got good safeguards, blah, 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 and then suddenly you have the, the world in, a, in an economic meltdown. And it's like, huh, so we missed something somewhere. What was that? Um, to lead, so, so the thing about black swans, and the, the key detail about a black swan is that it, it relates to a weakness that we have just from the way we are as human beings. And essentially what it is is that we, we um, build a narrative of our future based on our experiences in the past. If I woke up and was, had, a, had a certain experience today, I anticipate that I'm going to have a certain similar experience tomorrow. Um, we build this sort of narrative tunnel and we stay in it. So yesterday was a certain way, therefore I think tomorrow will be a certain way. And we, we get pretty locked into that narrative tunnel that says, oh yeah, things are stable and I understand generally, you know, there are surprises of course, but you know, in general I believe that if I get up at seven in the morning I can be trafficked to work, you know, whatever the thing is. And, and we, so we build those narratives and then we can be surprised too. Um, because we get really locked into that sense of, of knowing, we know what history told us and what our experience in our history, we're, we're good learning creatures, right? We learn from our history and therefore we extrapolate into the future. Um, and we do this all the time. Um, and the weakness is that we can miss things outside because when, once we've built an experience from history, we don't tend to look around very much. And uh, Taleb has this really, really interesting example of this, um, which I love. Um, and he says, now, if you imagine a turkey on a turkey ranch, every day the turkey gets fed. So every day the turkey gets fed and he quickly comes to conclude that people love him and they care about him and they want him to be happy. And every day this experience is reconfirmed. Every day he is in fact fed and every day he concludes, oh yeah, they love me, they care about me, and they want me to be happy. And his confidence increases you know, each time because, in fact, there's no, never been any data that tells him anything else. So he goes along like that, and his confidence increases, increases, increases. And then, on the day before Thanksgiving, he gets a different piece of data. 
<laughs> um, so interestingly, in that moment when, when the poor turkey is getting his new piece of data, as he's sort of lying there on his back with the axe coming down on his head as he's about to become Thanksgiving dinner, um, the ironic thing is that um, the, this sad turkey was never more confident than in that moment right before his head gets whacked off that people loved him and cared him about him and wanted him to be happy. Um, he had this rising tide of expectations and he was at his apex of confidence about that he understood his world and then whack. Um, Taleb says that the moment you should really be concerned is the moment when experts tell you that everything is fine. Um, when they assure you that it's all good, that's the moment you should start looking around because when they're sounding really confident, that's the moment to be worried. Um, and it's sort of an interesting thing because you sort of have to balance, you know, you know, rational concern with paranoia. And so there's, you know, there's a thin line between clever and stupid, that moment when you drop over into conspiracy theory. But, but nonetheless, you know, experts tell you, hey, our financial industry is totally stable. Wham! And, and then everybody's standing around going, oh yeah, that, that other, who knew? Subprime mortgages, tee hee! You know, and, and, uh, and so you look at that, and it's interesting though because you know, when that turkey's getting his new piece of data, he's pretty surprised about how things worked out. Uh, but, the, uh, but there's another player in that story, right? And that's the farmer. The farmer had the full picture. The farmer is not surprised what happens on the day before Thanksgiving. Um, and so what I've noticed about my writing is that my interest lies in that sort of gap between what we think we know about the world versus what's really happening in the world. That space where we have absolute confidence that we understand it, and that space where it's like, oh, we needed to be looking a little further, a little more consistently, with a little more cleverness, with a little more imagination. That's the zone that I'm interested in. And so it means that I'm not going to write much about computing technology. It means that I'm not going to write much about certain kinds of techno innovation because we have narratives that are already being spun out in a dozen different lines. And so I'm looking around for the hidden story. I'm looking around for the thing that we were missing. I'm looking around for that narrative that's going to surprise us and might, you know, chop off our heads. Um, and so that's sort of the, what I found is that's, that's sort, of, sort of the indicator of why I'm picking up a certain story um, and why it becomes an obsession for me is it fills that, satisfies that question mark sort of thing of like, what are we missing, you know? Um, so, you know, speaking about then, like, so the way that this all relates to the water knife is um, that, so I see you, Greg, back there. So in the back, back here is Greg Hanscom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this guy actually got me started on the, on the entire world that the water knife became because he used to be the editor at High Country News where we both used to work and he asked me to write a science fiction story for a non-fiction magazine um, and basically to spin out a future and some of the reporters that uh, we were all working with were um, Matt Jenkins who was doing a lot of reporting on water and uh, Michelle Nyhouse who was doing a lot of reporting on climate change and I sort of mashed together all the things that they were doing when they were doing their reporting and came up with the prototype for what became the water knife. It's called the Tamaris Cunner. Um, it was a short story about a drought on the Colorado River. And uh, anyway, um, <laughs> it's a little, I'm having a moment where my worlds are colliding here because <laughs> Greg quit and went on in other directions. So I quit and became a writer and stuff like that. Now I can see him back there and it's very unnerving. <laughs> <laughs> It's like my former boss or something back there. But um, um, anyway, uh, so the thing is, is like, so, you know, when I'm, uh, mm, 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 oh, okay. So the way this all relates to the water knife is that, uh, you know, when I was starting, I, I became interested in getting water. Um, and, and I was sort of interested in whether or not we were missing something about the idea of climate change, about whether or not we were, you know, there was something that might smack us upside the head. And interestingly, while I was doing research for the book, uh, it happened that there was a drought conference in Denver. I live in Colorado. And, uh, and it happened that I was actually near Denver at the time. And a friend of mine told me, she said, oh, there's this drought conference happening. You should check it out. I was like, huh, looked it up. Sure enough, could find an address. And I decided I'd just crash it. And, and it turns out there's no security at a drought conference. <laughs> yeah. It, who knew, right? <laughs> you just walk right in. <laughs> so, so I walk in like I belong, and I, you know, sit down, and I, I listen to all these 
really interesting people talk about this drought because what was happening is in 2012 when this conference was happening there was a 2000, the 2012 drought in Colorado was was, was particularly bad um, there was a, a shocking amount of damage that was happening because of it and so there were all these experts who were gathered together to talk about impacts to talk about mitigation uh, the governor came to speak uh, it was really and it was really quite informative and you know I got tons of ideas and data and stuff like that for myself um, it was interesting though because you could hear, you know, the thing about water that's really interesting to me is how many hidden spots it touches in our lives, how many different kinds of prosperity it provides for us. Um, you know, they could talk about things like, oh yeah, it's affecting our agriculture industry. Of course it is. You know, that seems pretty obvious. And then, you know, you can get a certain sense that it's affecting your tourism industry, sure, too, because, of course, if there's no snow in your mountains, you don't have a ski industry. Um, but there were other sort of weird follow-on effects, like, oh, if you don't have any snow in the mountains in the winter, that means you've got forest fires during the summer, which means all of the news coverage of your state is disaster coverage, and the tourists don't come in the summer either. And then after the fires have burned, and finally a rain does come, and then your entire slope slides away, and you end up at these uh, killer mudslides, then you get even more disaster coverage, and so even more tourism dies away. And you could see these kinds of, sort of cascades and connections and stuff like that. Um, but you were also seeing people like, people who worked for sewage plants, and, and they would say that they were experiencing sort of logistical difficulties because sewage plants need rivers to release their treated effluent into. And if the rivers are too low, they can't legally do it because they will poison the river. They need a, a dilution of fresh water with their treated effluent in order to sort of, in order to not poison the river. And they, so they were having problems with holding all of their, their sewage until there was actually enough water in the river to release. So you're seeing weird things like that where you're like, oh, huh. Never really thought about that, you know, it's like, and then you start thinking like, huh, like that means that like, if there's never enough water in the river, you just have to poison the rivers with that effluent. And you start thinking about rivers differently too. Um, it's just one giant long sewage channel. Um, yum. <laughs> I always go in the wrong direction with these thoughts, you know. Um, it's like, it's like this compulsion or something. Um, sorry, now I'm getting parched. Anyway, the, uh, the thing that was interesting to me, though, the most interesting was that I actually cornered somebody from Denver Water who was there. Um, and, and he'd said some interesting things during the conference, but I had some questions afterwards. And so I came up to him and I was like, so, you know, this, this 2012 drought is pretty bad. And he'd been talking about, you know, kind of the storage capacity that Denver had, how many reservoirs it had, the things, the moments when they actually trigger to start going on water restriction, you know, what, how low does a reservoir have to be before they go on water restrictions, things like that. It was fascinating stuff um, because, you know, in some cases they'll like, they'll guess that there might be problems in the, you know, later on in the summer, but they don't want to issue a false alarm and go on water restrictions too soon. So they kind of dig a hole for themselves first. And, you know, there's just weird things like that, policy things where they, they don't want to piss off the public before they absolutely have to, um, and which isn't great planning, but but makes perfect political sense. Um, and uh, but anyway, I asked him afterwards. I said, "So you know, this you guys are in a terrible drought right now, and so how many droughts like the 2012 drought do you think Denver can survive?" And he looks at me and he thinks and he says, "Well, I'd say five years." I think we could go five years if we had droughts exactly like this all in a row. And so, you know, he says like, you know, it would be bad, like we'd all be on terrible water restrictions, there'd be real curtailment of industrial water use, things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, all the trees would be dead. I mean, not just the lawns, but the trees would all be dead by then. Um, but we could hang on, Denver would still be here, it still would be hanging on. And. Uh, so I asked him, I said, so what are the chances that something like that could happen? And he looks at me and he says, well, it's never happened in the past. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, you know, there's this, just this moment where you're like, oh my God, you, you know, as a, as a science fiction writer who's planning a terrible disaster for places like Denver, um, you're absolutely delighted. Like, you're just, you've, given me, you've given me a plot point on a silver platter. I love you. You know, but um, as a citizen, you're a little bit concerned. <laughs> you know, this is the guy who's, you know, sort of supposed to be paying attention to whether or not that water always comes out of the tap. And, and his risk assessment is very much 
you know, sort of built for, you know, being slapped upside the head with a black swan. And, and, and you know, and so, of course, you know, the, the elephant in the room during this entire drought conference was, the, was climate change which no one ever said, um, you know, and this is only a couple of years ago and nobody could say the words climate change. It was too politically charged. When, when Governor Hickenlooper was in the room, he was like, well, we don't really want to talk about what's causing this or anything like that. We don't need to worry about that. What we're just going to talk about is we need more resilience in the state. And resilience is sort of the way that people duck and dodge past the idea that like our climate is changing us. We're going to be screwed. Um, so anyway, it's really interesting that that word couldn't even be uttered. Um, but, uh, um, I asked the, the Denver water guy, I was like, well, given that, given that climate change is happening, and that sort of means that like all of our historical record may be useless for giving us an idea of what we're, what we're headed for moving forward, um, where, how, how do you do your risk assessment? And, uh, and, uh, and he looks at me and he's like, he kind of hems and he haws, he's like, well, you know, that, that those calculations are really complex. Like that's really, it's very difficult. I mean, it's just very, and, and you know, I, I swear to God, I, I, you might as well have said, math is hard. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, just no attempt to engage with this question at all. And you were just like, oh, I am worried, but great plot point. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so anyway, so you sort of see that opportunity there. And, and as a science fiction writer, you're like, this guy, doesn't seem to be weighting the risks very heavily. Like he just, these are abstract risks to him. And this is very human actually. It's like, it's very hard for us to weight risks that are abstract, that are far in the distance, um, that are dispersed. Um, you know, we're really, really good at reacting to the tiger standing next to us. It's like, oh, tiger, run. Big crowd of people, run. Um, you know, those things, you know, trigger real visceral direct reactions. You know, California right now is in a drought and suddenly they're actually making some plans. Look at that. You know, they could have been making plans before, but they have to wait until there's a real visceral threat. Um, and similarly, this, this Denver water guy doesn't have a visceral threat. He has a theoretical threat. And, one of the things that I think is really interesting about fiction generally is that it gives us this opportunity to live lives that we never otherwise could have lived. Um, it gives us a chance to sort of build empathy for ideas or people that we never would have understood. You can live inside of the skin of somebody of a different gender, of a different race, from a different culture, and you can learn things from that. Um, and, you know, it sort of allows you to sort of land anywhere and become one with a set of surroundings and understand them better. Um, one of the things, I, you know, I think of fiction as, as, as being an empathy builder. Um, it, it crosses boundaries that maybe we could never cross otherwise. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about science fiction is that you can do that, but you can also do that sort of through time. Um, because we don't, we tend to sort of be very much in the here and now. That's what we're wired for. We're supposed to be here, we're supposed to be now, we're supposed to be looking out for the tiger right here, right now. We can't anticipate that future experience at all. We can't wait it, we can't take it seriously. But with science fiction, I can give you an experience far in the future about what that might be like. And so you can sort of change that equation of empathy where you can sort of say, hey, let's go live inside of the skin of a climate refugee and see how horrible this looks or see how risky this looks. And it's an opportunity for us to sort of see our future selves, that 30 year in the future self, who we basically discount because we're weighting all of our, all of our values and all of the benefit of everything that we do into our present moment and says, oh wait, maybe I do worry about what my future self is going to end up like because I can see it, because I can feel it, because I can live in it. Maybe I can wait a little bit more what my children's experience of the future is going to be like because I'm living in it inside of a book, inside of a piece of fiction. I feel like that's a, a superpower of science fiction that we can wait those future selves in a completely different way than we do when we're going around our daily lives. Um, and so, you know, with the water knife, that was sort of one of the ideas is I want to spin out that future. If I can look at Lake Mead and see it getting lower and lower, if we know that Lake Powell will never fill up again, um, if we know that climate change data says that mega droughts are more and more likely, spin out that future. Let's live in it. Let's think about it. And so with the water knife, um, I basically built this story around uh, two cities on the Colorado River, Las Vegas and Phoenix, and they're locked in sort of a fight over the last dregs of the Colorado River while California sort of looms over them, threatening to take everything. And, uh, and there are three major characters in the story. Um, there is Angel Velasquez, 
and Angel is a water knife for Vegas. And the thing about Vegas is that uh, you know between these two cities, Phoenix and Vegas, Vegas are the one. Vegas are the guys who planned. They're the people who sort of looked around and they said, "Wow, we have terrible water rights. We're a city in the middle of a desert." We're really, really vulnerable, and they say, "Okay, well, let's hunker down and start planning here." And so Vegas has done an extraordinary amount of work on trying to retain all their water. So they started building these things called cypress arcologies, which are these huge integrated living structures. Basically, there's housing and work areas, and you know they've got hanging gardens, they've got waterfalls, and um, down in the basements they have the casinos still way down in the grottos basically but um, they're these huge structures that like keep all of their water inside any water that comes in stays inside and gets recycled as many times as they possibly can do it they have their own you know uh, hydroponics uh, that uh, for growing food they they just sort of like use every bit of waste and keep it inside and they're very very efficient um, and the other thing that Vegas has is water knives, and water knives are sort of the 007s of water. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to make water rights exciting, okay? <laughs> Work with me here. Um, and, and what they do is they go out and they give people offers on their water rights that they can't, can't refuse. Um, they go out and they blow up another town's water treatment plant so that they can't pump out of the river and Vegas can. Um, they're the people who sort of go out and take care of things and give Vegas plausible deniability. Um, and, and so Angel is a water knife, and he's been sent down to Phoenix uh, to investigate the death of another water, right, water knife, and, and the rumor that maybe there are some water rights that might change everything for everyone that are surfacing down in Phoenix. And so he gets sent down to Phoenix, and Phoenix, in contrast to Las Vegas, has not been planning so much. And, and as a result, they're on the, on the edge of collapse. They've been breaking down slowly as their water has gotten less and less stable, as the property values have plummeted, as the tax base has left, as businesses have left. Um, and Phoenix is sort of you know, crumbling and trying to hang on. You know, they're trying to build their first arcology. And they're like late to the game. And, uh, um, and one of the characters who's down there is Lucy Monroe, and she's a journalist, and she's been covering the collapse of Phoenix for over 10 years. And so she started out as somebody who sort of stood on the outside, kind of laughing at the Phoenix people who didn't plan, and you know, as they get their asses handed to them. And uh, by this time, though, she's really connected to the people, and she has a lot of friends there. Um, and in particular, she has one friend who works inside of Phoenix Water who knows things that Angel wants. Um, and so Angel and Lucy are sort of on a collision path. Uh, Lucy sort of in her, in her dark moments calls herself a collapsed pornographer because she sort of covers all of this gloom and doom and destruction in Phoenix for the sort of voyeuristic pleasure of everybody else on the internet and everything else. That's where she gets all of her clicks and all of her money from, from uh, ad revenues and things like that is these, these terrible stories of like, oh look, here's another terrible thing that happened in Phoenix today and everybody clicks on it. And, um, she wants to write really deep and interesting stories about you know what's going on inside of the Phoenix Water Department and what kind of corruption might be there and who's getting payoffs, but nobody reads those stories, so she doesn't do very much of it. Um, and then the third character in the story is her wild card, and she's Maria Villarosa, and she's a climate refugee. Um, she has fled out of Texas, and in this story, most of the southern United States has been devastated by, by mega droughts and it's also been, they've been hit by hurricanes and floods and so like the weird weather, the intensified weather has, has really mangled the southern United States. And so a lot of refugees or people are on the move and so she's fled out. But the problem is as everybody tries to move out of the south, uh, the states that actually have more prosperity and more stability are sort of setting up uh, border patrols and trying to control the flow of immigration because they're concerned about being overwhelmed by the refugees. And so, you know, everybody's trying to hold back the Texans, basically. <laughs> and and um, anyway, so Maria has made it as far as Phoenix, but she can't get anywhere else. She can't go, she can't go north into Utah. She can't get into Nevada. She can't get into California. And she's stuck in Phoenix. So she's stuck as a sort of a second class, very much despised person in a city that's already falling apart. And I'm going to read just a short section from her perspective as soon as I get a drink of water. Privatized water. <laughs> hey, Paolo, can I take this opportunity to uh, just forecast the very near future, which is that um, our uh, registers will close at 8. So if you know you want to buy this book, that he is enticing us with. So we to do so before 8 p.m. Oh, dear, I didn't know that. So buy the book before 8 p.m. That's kind of a tight schedule you got us on here. Am I talking too long? No. Uh-oh. No. I'll talk loudly while you guys go to the registers. <laughs> <laughs>
Sorry, I didn't realize that. Um, anyway, I will read now from a, a short section of this, and then we'll go to question and answer. A ragged gouge cut the face of the Red Cross China Friendship water pump. Some kind of tool dug in. Burrowing carbon plastics like her daddy's plow had once ripped San Antonio dirt, except deeper and more angry. Maria wasn't sure who would attack the pump or what they thought they'd accomplish. Hell, that pump was armored. She'd seen a bulldozer bounce off its concrete defenses. That sucker wasn't going nowhere. It had been stupid of someone to try to cut it, and yet someone had. The price blazed through the scratch plastic. Six ninety-five a liter. Y for Gongjin. Gongjin meant leader in Chinese. Y was for Yuan. Everyone who lived anywhere near the Taiyang Arcology knew that number and that cash because all the workers got paid in Yuan and the Chinese had built the pump, too, because friendship, right? Maria had been learning Chinese. She could count to 1,000 and write the characters, too. E, R, San, Si, Wu, Liu, Qi, Ba. She'd been learning the tones. She'd been learning as fast as she could from the disposable tablets that the Chinese passed out to anyone who asked. The leader price glowed in the hot darkness, blue and indifferent, blurry from the human anger that had been hacked into it, but clear enough. Six ninety-five a liter. Every time Maria saw the ripped face of that pump, she thought she knew the person who had done it. Dios mio, she was that person. Every time she looked at the pump's cool blue number, she felt rage. She'd just never been lucky enough to swing a tool that had a chance of hurting it. You needed something special to make a cut like that. Not a hammer, not a screwdriver. Maybe one of those Yokohama cutters the construction crews used on the Taiyang back when her father had still worked there. They turn eye beams to dripping water, he'd said. Steel to leave. They turn steel to lava, Mia. You can't believe it. Even when you're standing right next to it. Magic, Mia. Magic. He'd shown her the special gloves he used to keep from slicing off a finger, glittering fabric that gave him a second and a half before his hand disappeared in a puff of smoke. Magic, he'd said. Big science. Who cared what the difference was? The Chinese knew how to make big things happen. Those cabrones knew how to build. The Chinese had money, and they made magic happen, and they'd train anyone to use their tech who was willing to sweat a 12-12 shift. Every morning, as the sun was starting to burn the sky blue, her father would return to Maria and describe the miraculous things he'd seen the night before while working on the high, exposed beams of the arcology. He described the massive construction printers that poured solids into form, the shriek of injection molds, the assembled pieces being craned up into the sky. Just-in-time construction. They had silicon PV sheeting that they poured over walls and windows to generate power, dumped it on like paint, and the next thing you knew, you were full electric. None of the rolling brownouts that hit the rest of Phoenix for the tie-on. No way. Those people made their own power. They fed their workers lunch. I'm working in the sky, he'd said. We're all good now, Mia. We're going to make it. And from now on, you're going to study Chinese, and we don't just got to go north. We can cross the ocean, too. The Chinese, they build things. After this job, we can go anywhere. That had been the dream. Papa was learning how to cut through anything, and soon he'd be able to slice through the barriers that kept them trapped in Phoenix. They'd cut their way through to Vegas or California or Canada. Hell, they'd cut a path all the way across the ocean to Chongqing or Kunming. Papa could work the upper Mekong and Yangtze dams that kept water for the Chinese. He was going to build. With his new skills, he could cut through anything. Fences and California guardies and all the stupid state border control laws that said you had to stay in a relief zone and starve instead of going where God still poured water from the sky. A Yokohama cutter slices through anything, he'd said, and snapped his fingers, just like butter. So maybe it was a Yokohama cutter that they'd used on the Red Cross pump. But even that tool hadn't gotten them a drink. You could cut your way to China, maybe, but you couldn't cut your way to a cool glass of water in Phoenix. Maria wondered what price had driven the person to go after the pump. Ten dollars a liter? Twenty? Or maybe it had only been six ninety-five, just like now. But to those people, six ninety-five had seemed like their first Phoenix police baton to the teeth, something they just couldn't accept. Maybe those way back when people hadn't known that six ninety-five was going to be as good as it got forever after didn't know that they should have been counting their blessings. 
instead of taking a cut at the pump. Alrighty, um, let's see. If, if other people do want to get a hold of books and stuff like that, I didn't realize that time was so tight. Um, please do. Um, you don't even have to get books from me, actually. Um, I, I would say that like one of the things that's amazing about having independent bookstores is that they can actually put on events like this. So if you like these kinds of events, buy books. Um, these guys are businesses and they need support And in order to do these kinds of things. And I firmly believe that having bookstores in your physical community means that you are closer to having a positive future rather than a negative one like the ones I create. And so you don't have to buy my books, but buy a book um, because it really does make a difference. And I think that that's you know, one of the things I noticed when I was in other countries was that um, when I was like in France, I was invited over to do uh, the promotion for my, my French editions. And, and they, have, they have bookstores on, on every street and it's really, it's a really, really powerful thing to see books as a part of culture, ideas as a part of culture. So, yeah. Um, anyway, I really appreciate University Bookstore for having me. So, you don't have to buy my books, but do please think about buying books in general, like a lot of them. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, I, yeah, if anybody else needs to get stuff, that's fine. I was just going to go to question and answer now. Um, so, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, I, I noticed in reading The Water Knife, you, you just kind of... Uh, toss it out as an, uh, just as a passing idea, but you mentioned uh, all the salts building up in, uh, you know, in the lakes and in the rivers because of uh, the old ocean that used to be in the center of the United States. And you know, that's one of the things I like about your books is that you've got so many ideas that you just kind of toss out you know, almost in passing an idea like that. Yeah, I, so this is just yeah about world building and stuff. I try to I try to build pretty complete worlds, and I try to try to find lots of little details. And you might not explore all of them. I think probably the salt thing might have had to do with uh, irrigation. That's possible because uh, one of the things about irrigation is that especially sort of flood irrigation is it tends to build up all kinds of salt on the landscape, and over time actually poisons the land. Ironically. Um, and as you get further and further down through the, the river basins, as water gets um, more and more sort of evaporated again and again, then you end up with more and more saline water. Um, but yeah, those details are, are fascinating to me, and you sort of want to find as many ways as possible to slide little bits of the world into, into the characters' lives. So, other questions? Yeah. Um, Heinlein says one of his um, things for writing is finish what you write. So when do you know when you're Oh, okay. So, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With line of growth, there, there was. A, I mean, you said you create complete worlds. Right. A huge amount of stuff. It's like how. Right, 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 right. right. Too much so this is a question about uh, how do you know when you're finished um, when you're writing? Heinlein says, "Finish what you write." How do you know when you've gotten there? Um, exhaustion actually is my normal answer. There's, <laughs> there, there's some point where you just kind of collapse and you're like, I don't know, like it's, it's kind of like what I wanted it to be. Um, but I, I got no more, I got no blood left in me anymore. So um, it's, it is sort of an exhaustion moment. Uh, one way I have thought about it though is that when I'm turning it into like an editor or an agent or whatever, um, one of the things I'm thinking is I want them to reject it for the right reasons. Um, so you know, that the, you know you're done when, when the book Will will be liked or hated based on precisely what it is, not for something else. You know, if like they, you know, they say, "I hate the Southwest." You're like, "Great, you hate it for the right reasons. That's fantastic." <laughs> you know, um, if they say, if they say, "Well, I sort of feel like this is a much more emotional book," I'm like, "This is a thriller. Like that, I'm done it wrong, and then I need to keep working." You know, that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Partly is like, does this thing feel like it represents the concept in my head? Um, but yeah, it's it's a moving target. I mean, there is some moment where you just give up. Right? You're like, you never see bookstores be closing in seven minutes. So, I'm going to leave the till over there open because we're obviously working out of my set problems. Okay. Don't go all night. Okay. Well, 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 okay. <laughs> Let's do a couple more questions because I do feel bad like keeping people really late. But um, I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards too. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your character development and how you 
Sure. Uh, so this is a question about character development and how do I go about it. Um, oftentimes, actually, I start from theme. Um, I, I tend to start from a very intellectual level, like I want to write about climate change and drought, and then I come down into another level and I say, okay, so how many angles do I want to have on that? And so then I'll say, oh, I want to have access to, and I know this sounds really intellectual to get to someplace emotional, but, but uh, I start with, you know, I want to get access to something visceral with someone like Angel, who's a water knife, or I want to get to, you know, some experience of, of people being powerless, like Maria, where she's been completely disenfranchised and is a refugee. Um, but then what I'm doing is, is I'm really sort of like, you know, running through the scenarios in my head, like, okay, so what's it feel like to be in a drought? Like, what's it feel like to not have any water to wash? What's it feel like to be in a situation where the, the world is breaking? And you're trying to find as many examples as you can, like, you know, where do they go to find water? Where do they, you know, how do they go to the bathroom? Where, where, what are the, how are they finding their solutions? Who is taking advantage of them? Who is, you know, and you're sort of building out those, like, you know, just pieces that are around them in some ways. Um, and then, and then, I don't know, you imagine. Uh, you know, there's, there's something like you, 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 you empathize with these characters. They're all in different situations and then you said they're all trying to do the best they can. I almost always start with the idea that characters are trying to do the best they can, even if they're doing terrible things. Um, that, you know, it's the best they can in their, given their situation. And so I'll squeeze them into a spot where they don't have many options, but they're always trying to be as good as they can. It's just that they don't have a lot of options anymore. Um, and I think um, inside of that, we tend to have empathy. Um, you know, the the you know they do still care about other people. They aren't you know sort of these black and white you know sort of like oh I'm saintly or oh I'm terrible. It's like they care about people, but they're also terrified about whether they'll survive. How much are you going to help your friend when you think that you're about to get killed for doing it? You know, you've got a choice. And however you choose, you're probably going to empathize with the character because you could feel that choice in, inside. Um, but I mean, some, I, I think a lot of it is just that you really, you love your characters. You love them, you know, terribly and you, you, you sort of want them to do okay even though you've set them up for failure in so many ways. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, another question? Yeah, in the back. Um, I know you're here to promote the current book, but I read it already and I've read all your previous books, except for the zombie one, I'm gonna wait till my son's old enough for that. But uh, so he only has to be eight. <laughs> go on, yeah, yeah, yeah. go on, go on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm hassling you. Um, but uh, so I'm curious, uh, and you might not know, but what do you have any idea of what themes or issues or settings you want to explore next or think about writing about? So what am I thinking about next? Um, probably, you know, the next, there's, there's two things that I'm sort of thinking about. One of them is I want to write another book in the Shipbreaker series called Seascape because I'm really interested in a society that sort of planned ahead and sort of saved itself but didn't save any of the people around it um, and what kind of problems that generates. Um, and then the other thing I'm really interested in is biodiversity. Um, I'm really interested in the questions. It feels like another one of those silent sort of threatening things. It's like how many species can you delete before it matters? Um, and that's uh, yeah, that's interesting to me. Um, I think I've run long actually. So uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. I don't want to keep uh, people working overtime when they shouldn't have to. Um, but thank you all for coming. I'm going to be signing books. Please do buy books, anybody's books. I, I, I don't, I'm not hurt. <laughs> um, but, uh, but thank you for all for coming out. You're wonderful. Uh -huh.